Thank you so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to start off and let you know a couple of reasons why I wrote this book. Um, when I was teaching at the high school level, um, I went, for the 11 years that I was there, I went from students that were coming through ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and, and um, 12th grade, that you know they were still very excited about their lives. They were excited about moving forward. Some of them were ready to go to college. Some of them weren't. Some of them wanted to work for a while. They weren't quite sure what they wanted to do. Um, but they, uh, in the beginning part, the first five, six years of teaching, I had a lot of students that were very uh, excited just about their lives and getting out of high school and moving forward. Uh, the last couple of years, though, got very dark. Um, I had a lot of students that were very depressed. Um, I had students that um, confided a lot in me, especially in uh, the one assignment that I gave them every January. So I had um, two classes of freshmen, two classes of juniors, and so there are about 30 students each um, in each class. And the assignment I would give them is a personal narrative about, um, you know, just tell me an event in your life that changed your life. Um, and, uh, you know, first person account. And in the past, I always had students that told stories, cute little stories about when they were five or six and they stole a pack of gum and had to return it and how they were devastated and never wanted to steal again. Um, or, you know, sometimes it was a little sad, more sad about the um, death of a grandparent or something along those lines. In the last couple of years, though, um, I, out of almost 100 students that I had writing this personal narrative, I had almost 70 of them write about suicidal thoughts, attempting suicide, cutting themselves, or knowing somebody that did, in fact, commit suicide. Um, it was so hard, especially that last year. I cried for two weeks while I was grading those papers. I couldn't believe how much pain my students were in. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the one thing that just kept on coming out in all of their essays was how they just felt like they weren't good enough as they were. Um, they couldn't find things to be happy about. They were um, always so uh, just sad and depressed about their situation and their lives. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I couldn't continue moving forward in education the way it was, because I, I really truly believe that some of the things that were happening in public education are, were contributing to those feelings. Uh, they weren't jumping through the right educational hoops. They weren't, um, they weren't able to um, use their skills, their talents, their things that they were really good at, and you know, especially the creative students. They weren't allowed to use those things because they had to have more of the logical, sequential side of their um, of their intelligence, and they some of them just weren't very good at that. And then they weren't given opportunities to show where you know to do things where they could shine. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book because I wanted to show that what we can do for our children is to help them um, embrace who they are to enjoy who they are as people. They can then find something, a place where they can plug in. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean going to college or even going to college right away. Um, they can take their time, but they need to find out who they are and what makes them happy. Um, and so um, that's one of the, the chapters that I'm gonna read today. Um, it's about happiness. So, um, not that I wanted to thoroughly depress all of you <laughs> with the beginning of that, but I just wanted to let you know that um, there is a little bit of help that we can give. You know, it's not so much that we can teach happiness, but we can give them the tools, give our students and children the tools to find what makes them happy. Um, and one thing that we can do as the adults and people in, in um, their lives is to um, show them, talk to them about respect and kindness and thankfulness. Um, and a lot of other, the cha other chapters that I have in this book that I wrote about those things. Um, and so it shows uh, that um, we can show ourselves and the children, the students, people around us that they are enough and that they do matter. So here's my chapter, chapter 19, teach them how to be happy. Happiness sometimes can elude all of us. What does it mean to be happy? Can we teach happiness? One of the goals of education is to help students discover their strengths and abilities. As they discover who they are, 
students can figure out how to use their unique gifts and talents to make the world a better place. If they know they matter in the world, they will be happy. One thing I did, did as an educator was create a lesson to help my students find their purpose. They seemed to be so melancholy, especially the last few years I taught, that I didn't want to miss an opportunity to address their hearts. Educating the whole child meant that I educated their hearts and minds. I borrowed many of these questions from various sources and put them together into this lesson. So on a PowerPoint slide, I put this information. What is your purpose in this life? Your job in life is to figure out the answer to that question and determine how you will share it with the world. Get out a notebook and respond truthfully for your eyes only truth to the following questions. So I'll wait while you get out your, um, okay. <laughs> Not in class right now, so you don't have to get out paper, but um, you can still have, think about the answers to these questions. So number one, what do you love? What do you fear? What makes you sad? What do you find beautiful? What matters to you? What do you believe in? Everyone should have a credo. Write at least five statements that start with, I believe. What would you do if you only had three months to live? Who are you? Write at least five statements that start with, I am. So along with that list, I also included a visualization exercise. So I know that I'm not teaching right now, but I think all of you can do this, this visualization part. So visualize the next 24 hours if you and only you were making decisions about how you would spend your time. So close your eyes, do it. <laughs> What do you see yourself doing? What would, you bring, what would bring you the most enjoyment? Okay, you can open your eyes. <laughs> the answers to your questions and what you visualize hold the key to your heart's desire and purpose. Your job now is to find the common threads. See what your words are telling you. No one but you can tell what it all means. And you don't have to figure it all out right this minute. It's okay to give it time. It's okay to enjoy the journey, especially because you'll know that you're on the right path, your path. But don't forget, use your discoveries to make the world a better place. However, I want to caution you about three deterrents to finding your true purpose. Number one, the voices in your head. You need to forget about what everyone else thinks you should be or what people have told you that you can't be. Turn off the tapes that have been playing in your head and start with a clean slate. Number two, envy. If you feel envious towards anyone, then you believe the lie that you have to be like someone else to be successful in your life. You just need to be you. Number three, people pleasing. If you are a people pleaser, then you would believe the lie that you have to get certain people to like you in order to be successful. What other people think of you is none of your business. So don't work so hard to get their approval. So I'm gonna hold tight to that one now that my book is out there and people I'm sure are gonna be judging me for it. <laughs> um, so now here's my parables from the portable. Uh, if you don't know what a portable is, it's a trailer that we would add onto the school because we didn't have enough room for uh, all the students in our school. So early in my teaching career, I was naive and idealistic. I guess I'm still a little idealistic, but just not as naive. I was still in the habit of standing outside my door and smiling and greeting every student who walked into my room. As the years progressed, I still smiled at my students, but I greeted them at the beginning of class from the front of the room instead of outside. <laughs> it just made more sense as the days became colder. Greeting my students with a smile was one of the best parts of my day. All I had to do was smile at them, and they would smile back. It was very rewarding. And oh look, you guys are doing that too. Thank you. <laughs> so if a student did not look at me while um, walking into the portable, I would tap him or her on the shoulder and smile my biggest smile. My students thought I was the biggest goof, but it worked, and I loved it. I have had many students over the years who would tell me, you know, I could be in the worst mood ever, and then I'd walk into your room and you just made everything okay. It was humbling to hear that I could affect my students that way. I felt like I, it was one of my superpowers. The smiling teacher woman transforms students' lot days with her mythical smiling powers. I've actually stopped a number of student fights with my smile. One day I was walking through the common area and I saw one of my students, Andre, go toe to toe with another student. Andre had the tendency of acting like a thug, even though he had a heart of gold. So I knew the look on his face meant trouble, that and the quickly growing circle of bystanders around the two of them. I walked right up and wedged myself in between them while looking at Andre with a big smile on my face. Andre was in his combat zone, so when his death glare finally registered my smile, his face melted into an aw shucks grin. Hi, Andre, what's going on? Um, hey, Mrs. Hawkins, 
nothing now. <laughs> he shook his head with the same grin. That's good. Do we need to go for a walk? Nope, there's no way I can stay angry when you smile at me like that. His words brought out a grumble from the slowly dispersing crowd. You're welcome, glad I could help. See you in class later. You will now, said Andre as he shook his head and realized that everyone else had already walked away. Superpower. Another time, students were yelling at each other on the deck outside my portal. I didn't even know the two students. I just walked outside, smiled at them both, and asked them to fill me in on what was bothering them. Even though they both became belligerent with me, I continued to smile. Hey, look guys, whatever's going on, we can work it out together with words. I just wanna help. I flashed them my beefiest grin. The argument immediately deflated. A second later, half the school exited out the doors toward my portable. They were not happy that smiling teacher woman broke up another fight. Superpower. I know it sounds corny, but I took an oath to, to use those powers for good, not evil. Great responsibility and all. So back to the naive and idealistic days. I had a new transfer student that joined the class halfway into the semester. I had yet to see his eyes, let alone his smile. He walked down the path to my portable with his head down. The third or fourth class I had with him, I stopped him before he could enter my portable. Hold on, I put on my goofiest smile for him. Let me see those pearly whites. He barely looked up at me, separated his lips so I could just make out that he indeed had teeth, and moved past me. I chuckled, well, that will do for now. I thought he was being funny, but I found out the next day that smiling teacher woman abused her powers. I opened my email to discover an email from this boy's mom. She berated me for smiling at her son and that I was never to force him to do such a thing again. He felt humiliated by me and that I had to realize that her son was just not a happy person. And that's all there was to it. This is how she finished her email in all caps. Don't ever make him smile again. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. No, un un no unauthorized use of superpowers ever again with your unhappy son. However, what she did not know was that I continued to smile at him in hopes that my superpower would eventually wear down his gloom shield and he would someday find his happiness. So my suggestions that I give to parents especially uh, never underestimate the power of a smile. Obviously, if parents do not want to smile or have their child smile, it can create difficulties. However, sometimes happiness can begin with a smile. Parents can bring happiness into their home simply by making it a point to look into their child's eyes on a daily basis and smile until he or she smiles back. Parents can also use the lesson I shared earlier in the chapter as conversation starters. Those conversations can take place in the car, during a meal or bedtime. Talking to a child about the things he or she loves or fears will not only help him or her learn to communicate those things, but will also help parents truly understand their child. It will then have the added benefit of helping the child find his or her purpose and place in the world. Laughter is powerful. Telling jokes, sharing embarrassing moments, watching comedies and reading silly stories can teach a child to find the humor in life. It will also be easier to teach a child to laugh at him or herself in awkward situations if the child is already surrounded by laughter. Some of the unhappiest people in the world are those who cannot laugh at themselves. So don't forget the power of a smile. Thank you.